War is part of our human experience, but the way we fight it is changing. Technology is defining the future of warfare. It's changing the way we think about making decisions in warfare, providing capabilities that were previously unreachable. Lessons from the past inform the future. At every technological leap redraws the battle lines we once knew. Technology was once a spear. Today, it is a cyber attack. The amount of interconnected technology has fundamentally transformed the operational environment. Familiar domains grow increasingly complex, and the race to dominate the ultimate high ground has begun. In the same way we think about sea power, we need to start thinking about a strategy for space. As machines take the reins, the speed of warfare accelerates ever faster. Technology has always shaped war. Evolution has always happened in war and in society. It will continue to happen. War has always shaped humanity. In this age of hyperconnectivity, our lives rely on technological systems like never before. We are entangled in the tentacles of the internet and our data is prone to invasion. Conflict now happens in the virtual domain, where the push of a button beats the squeeze of a trigger, bringing disorder without a single soldier setting foot on the ground. The future of warfare is cyber. What would happen if we all got up one morning and nothing was working. There was no internet. Our public transport systems wouldn't work. Our roads wouldn't work. Everything wouldn't work. And that's an interesting perspective when you look at what a military might do to shut down a jurisdiction before they go in and fight a battle. Two days before Christmas in 2015, the lights went out in Ukraine. Hackers had infiltrated three electricity distribution companies and they'd done so with remarkable ease, simply by attaching malware-infected code to Word documents and PowerPoint presentations sent to company executives by email. The malware, called Black Energy, was attributed to a Russian cyber gang by the name of Sandworm. Having infiltrated the electrical company's computer systems, the hackers now had the ability to flip the power grid circuit breakers the electrical supply of almost a quarter of a million people began to falter. But the hackers didn't stop there. The next phase saw utility company call centers inundated with a barrage of automated telephone calls. A multi-wave attack was underway. Chaos and confusion soon led to outrage as complaints from frustrated customers and reports from company response teams went unheard. Call centers were overwhelmed. Ukraine was plunged into darkness. When light shone again in Ukraine, a new realization dawned. It was the first documented time a cyber attack had directly targeted and taken down a nation's power grid. The border between the physical and the digital had been broken down. In 1969, the first message was sent across ARPANET, the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network. And it was from this first step that the internet as we know it today was born. Now, billions of people use the internet each and every day. It is interwoven into the very fabric of our society. The internet has created tremendous access to information and technology for basically vast number of populations across the globe. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. So as long as there is internet connectivity, you can access everything that exists on the internet. 
And as a result, there's a tremendous amount of positive things that come out of it. People can stay in touch. People can have access to educational materials. People can do business remotely and build collaborations. But at the same time, it creates a vulnerability surface. We used to go to the internet when we think back to the mid-1990s. Now we live in the internet, particularly via mobile smart devices. And invariably, the first thing we do in the morning is check our device. The last thing we do at night is check our device and we're on it all day. That gives a range of options to a military to weaponize that aspect of it because it's so integrated in our day-to-day -day lives. Critical infrastructure supports our connected lives. The water we drink, the food we eat, our banking systems, GPS-reliant transportation and transportation hubs, government services, communication networks, our smart vehicles, smart homes, smart offices and factories, our smart cities. All are cyber-reliant, and being so, all are prone to cyber attack. We have spent the last 20 or so years really focusing on development of new technology. We've developed a lot of this technology without barely any security or privacy baked in. If we try to understand what cyber warfare looks like from the offensive and defensive aspects, we have to take into account first the large number of computerized systems deployed in each country's armed forces and in the civil sector of each country. That reliance creates vulnerabilities in just everybody's computer system and computer devices. In cyber warfare, the aim is to attack key weapon systems of the enemy, to attack key civil infrastructure of the enemy, to undermine their war effort. And then we have to ask ourselves the question, well, how many unique computerized systems are there in the armed forces of the adversary country? This is probably well in excess of 5,000 unique computerized systems in any military force. And we're looking then at in excess of 10 or 20,000 unique computerized systems in the civil infrastructure of any country. Sie sitzen irgendwo und verfügen über 200.000 PCs, die über die halbe Welt verstreut sind, alle mit einem prima Internetanschluss und die alle für Sie irgendwas tun können. Und mit einem Kommando an Ihrer Tastatur können Sie diese Rechner jetzt zum Beispiel veranlassen, irgendeinen bestimmten Rechner total schachmatt zu setzen. In most organizations and in most countries, cybersecurity is weak to very weak. And this gives huge potential for an attacker in cyber warfare and imposes huge burdens on the defender. The amount of effort that it takes to secure a computer system essentially continues to grow exponentially, whereas the amount of effort to penetrate a computer system is linear because all you need is one vulnerability. Cyber warfare is disruptive warfare, and it heralds a new era of military operations, reshaping the combat zone into a multi-platform digital battle space, where data is the loaded gun. It can enable whichever side you're on. It can also disable whichever side you're on. So it really is the length and breadth of every aspect. It allows you to manifest organizations that may not have existed before because the connectivity between the air, sea and land forces is potentially very, very tight and you're able to command operations and make changes in much more quicker timeline than has been possible in the past. The potential for cyber attacks to impact the physical world had been realized as early as 2010 when the Natanz nuclear facility in Iran was attacked. A malicious malware computer program, Stuxnet, often referred to as a worm, had infiltrated Iran's nuclear enrichment facility. Someone physically brought in the code, and we don't know how really that happened. There's been suggestions of a USB thumb drive just being plugged into a, the front of a device. Stuxnet was a malicious computer worm that is widely understood, although not confirmed, to have been an American and Israeli operation deployed in an Iranian nuclear reactor. Undetected, 
the Stuxnet worm worked its way through the facility's industrial control system. Once the code was injected into the facility, we saw that the Siemens control systems spin out of control and subsequently not work anymore. Stuxnet took out one in five centrifuges at the reactor where it was deployed. And you think previously that would have been possible only through bombing or inserting people in the ground. Like a scene from a spy movie, the Stuxnet worm also secretly recorded daily operations within the facility, playing them in a loop to plant operators, convincing them that nothing out of the ordinary was happening. In fact, the centrifuges were shredding themselves apart. Between 2009 and 2010, close to 1,000 centrifuges in the Iranian facility were destroyed. That really resulted in the Iranian nuclear project being set back, you know, some months, potentially some years. I think really it goes to show what can occur using a line of code to actually break something physical. The success of Stuxnet at the Natanz nuclear facility shifted the shape of traditional war methodologies and conventional military operations. This notion of cyber attacks and notion of cyber warfare has evolved quite significantly over the last few decades. I'd like to frame this in context of uh, diversity of cyber attacks. Traditionally, the notion of a cyber attack was focused on attack on essentially a computer system. So attacking computers' networks, hard drives, operating systems, etc. For example, Someone can uh, send you a piece of malware, which is a malicious piece of software that essentially encrypts your hard drive. That is a type of attack that's typically referred to as ransomware. So your computer system is now encrypted and you cannot access any information on your system. In 2017, a piece of ransomware took the world by storm and demonstrated the true havoc a cyber attack could wreak upon society. Ukraine was again the target of a cyber attack that seemingly came from nowhere. Not Petya, a ransomware worm that spread across 10% of all computers in Ukraine. Like before, transportation hubs, banks, government agencies, media outlets, and utility companies were paralyzed. NotPetya then crossed borders. Russia, the US, France, shutting down oil companies, hospitals, pharmaceutical and food production companies. In Copenhagen, it took the world's largest shipping firm, Moller Maersk, offline. The havoc that NotPetya caused was costed at approximately $10 billion. Another type of cyber attack could essentially be a denial of service attack, essentially uh, preventing people from being able to access the system by either generating too many messages or essentially fully utilizing the capacity of the central processing unit. These are the cyber attacks that exploit the connectivity of our modern lives, that can shut down our ports and airports, expose private, corporate, and military secrets and bring a society to its knees. However, like malicious malware that continues to reinvent itself, so too does the way in which cyber attacks occur. We use the term cyber everywhere, but really it's information security, which is at the heart of what we do. And so in a future theater, how you shape the use of the information, whether that's winning the hearts and minds of people, whether that's being disruptive to your enemy and their use of information and everything in between. And it's the shaping of information that leads to some of the most insidious forms of cyber warfare. Cyber warfare is information greedy. It feeds on and manipulates our collective consciousness. One person's truth is another person's fake news and the difference between can be exploited. Populations were once bombarded with propaganda dropped from planes above. Today, our cyber world connects us to the infinite and immeasurable influence of others.
Probably in the last five to 10 years, the notion of information warfare has really emerged as another dimension of a potential offensive or defensive cyber capability. What we're talking about is the conduct of political warfare through cyberspace. It's really the activity of one set of political leaders trying to do something quite nasty and quite serious to another country or another set of political leaders. Information is a valuable commodity in the cyber world. Exploited, it can be used to blackmail leaders, cajole voters, fan the flames of discontent, disseminate propaganda, and create mythology. Today's society is so dependent on data that data makes it possible for us to organize our societies, our political systems, and even our private lives. In the lead up to the 2016 US presidential elections, the British firm Cambridge Analytica unlawfully mined data from 87 million Facebook users. With this data, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump's campaign team used psychographics to map voter personalities based on opinions, values, interests, and more, which then allowed them to surgically target Facebook users with carefully sculpted advertisements for political gain. Do you think that you have an ethical obligation to notify 87 million Facebook users? Senator, when we heard back from Cambridge Analytica that they had told us that they weren't using the data and had deleted it, we considered it a closed case. <coughs> In retrospect, that was clearly a mistake. The Cambridge Analytica scandal, where essentially a lot of the private data was used to target election resources to private citizens. And it wasn't obvious to the citizens as to what was happening. Social media has become an integral part of our lives. It connects us, entertains us, and it also informs us. The Cambridge Analytica scandal highlighted just how important our personal data really is, and just how much of it was being passed around behind the scenes. But when it comes to social media, it's not just our own information that matters. The information passed down to us is just as important too. If you can master Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, then you've got 90% of the market covered. We look at the various ways that cyber has shaped our environment, and it's particularly where we get our news sources from now. So because we have a couple of dominant sources, if you want to radicalize people, and it's been proven in the past, you start winning those hearts and minds via that way, and you start getting your messaging out there. And when people just go to that one place for news, they're gonna start believing that to be the case. We've created this environment where things like misinformation, disinformation, and propaganda can be amplified through the scale of the communication technology. We essentially are at a point where there's a potential to compromise freedom of thought. If someone's very in much interested in manipulating how you think, they have access to a broad amount of information around you, which has just existed out there. Privacy is just recently now becoming a concern, and neither regulations nor technologies are, are keeping up with the potential space of vulnerabilities. Information warfare can be understood as either that narrow cyber domain or what's emerged more recently around the political warfare that countries like China, Russia, and the United States are actively engaged in. Something that intentionally creates misinformation, so false information. Things that are more formally malicious, where there's a malicious intent, where there's a desire to change people's minds or create confusion can be another type of an attack. Leveraging interconnectedness of infrastructure to manipulate populations into thinking or acting a certain way. States or non-state actors that want to use information warfare uh, capitalize on the idea that if you can disrupt a society from within by creating more factions, by creating more conflict between parties, you'll be able to prevent that other society from responding effectively to you, either to your political threats or to your military threats. So they're relying on the assumption that a breakdown in social trust is beneficial to them.
The 2016 U.S. presidential election was the hotspot for yet another cyber event. Fake social media accounts targeting Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton sowed seeds of confusion and discord amongst the U.S. electorate. There was a lot of accounts on social media that were purposefully generating falsified information to often just create confusion in the population, leading to impact on U.S. elections. The U.S. intelligence agencies concluded that there was Russian interference. Some of it could be traced to the Internet Research Agency, which is a Russian organization, which was essentially focused on infiltrating the trust of American public. Ну, это был вот отдел Фейсбука, так называемый, да? А вот там как раз работали все переводчики и те, кто владели иностранным языком. Ну, вот, естественно, они и занимались Фейсбуком капитально. Вот сейчас мы читаем, как. I sort of see that the moment that we're living in right now is essentially a new Sputnik moment. That was the first uh, space satellite. And the United States was very much surprised by this event. And then during the U.S. election, essentially the manipulation of a lot of the social network technology took the U.S. completely by surprise. It's a similar feel as it was during the Sputnik era. And I think part of the reason that occurred is that, you know, we weren't really paying attention to how technologies were being used. The epidemic of malicious fake news and false propaganda that flooded social media over the past year it's now clear that so-called fake news can have real-world consequences. Governments, militaries, and civilians have come to understand that technology can be used to mask the source of real threats. Distracting us with the trivial, the cute, the scandalous and conspiratorial while military maneuvers take place. There's technology layers underlying a lot of the threat surface. And understanding of technologies is vital to understanding the threat landscape. But really to understand the threat, you have to understand the geopolitics and the human interactions with it. The Russians, the same as everybody else, seem to have expected Hillary Clinton to be the incoming president. And what they were trying to do, is, as best we can work out, was generate disruption, and chaos for a very limited period of time in order to allow them to move in their physical domain in a number of places uh, around the world. Through November and December of 2016, Russia showered Syria with heavy air and cruise missile bombing. Their objective, to drive out anti-government rebel forces in eastern and southern Aleppo, Syria. So if you start a clock, at the moment that the US election happened on November the 8th, 2016. In the next month, the Russians moved in and captured Aleppo city in Syria. They then immediately launched an offensive into Eastern Aleppo province. And at the end of that month, they launched the Advika offensive in Ukraine. All of that happened in a two month period after the election. All of it had to have been prepared at least six months out. In Ukraine, several months before the Evdivka offensive began, an online military forum popular with Ukrainian military personnel had heavily promoted an Android application, claiming to vastly improve the data processing speed of D-30 howitzer field guns. The field guns used data for targeting. The speed would be reduced from minutes to seconds. Huge numbers of Ukrainian artillery forces installed the app without a second thought. The Ukrainian military were using a very old Soviet-era artillery piece. In order to make that more accurate, they used Android cell phones to generate an app that would give you a precise firing solution for an individual gun. And that allowed them to disperse and hide the weapons, uh, coordinate the firing remotely, uh, link into GPS devices. I uh, gave them a dramatically higher level of precision.
Little did they know, the application had been implanted with malware known as X-Agent. Russian cyber militia by the name of APT-28, otherwise known as Fancy Bear, working for Russian intelligence, hacked the app, created a backdoor that allowed them to figure out exactly where every Ukrainian gun was that was using this device. So as pro-Russian rebel troops surged toward the stronghold area of Avdivka, a cyber attack was already underway. Twenty minutes before the start of the Advika offensive in January of 2017, Russian-backed artillery started knocking out every Ukrainian gun that was using the device. So they coordinated a cyber attack with a social media campaign with a physical attack into a single unified operation in order to achieve a lethal physical effect on the ground. So it's kind of like a one-two punch, right, where you've got a cyber operation that positions you for your next move, which is physical, and that then sets you up for your next cyber move in a sort of integrated maneuver. The benefits of that approach are so profound that I think people are going to start jumping on that bandwagon and we're going to see more uh, and more of that going forward. Cyber technology is advancing at an exponential rate. As cyber warfare capabilities are realized by more and more adversaries, the cybersecurity apparatus must develop simultaneously. In 2020, the U.S. Department of Defense requested just under 10 billion U.S. dollars to continue to improve their cyber capability and lethality and to evolve cyber safeguards at the same pace at which cyber technology develops. The United States is the wealthiest, most scientifically advanced country in the world. It has the best cybersecurity capability in the world. But it's admitted many times that it's largely incapable of defending itself in cyberspace, in conflict. The technical literacy of an average warfighter really needs to increase to match the capabilities that exist. This is something that there's a lot of discussions, certainly in the US military, about the need for training to keep up with availability of technology. Technology training, cybersecurity training, fundamentals of a lot of the technologies uh, really need to be included in essentially military training. Cyber warfare changes the rules of engagement, exists in a new warfare space, a borderless environment, making it difficult for friends or foes to determine both how to engage in or respond to a cyber attack. If we think about the more traditional warfare, sort of the kinetic engagement and things like uh, nuclear positioning, uh, space positioning, etc there are significantly more geographic boundaries. The key thing about interconnectivity of today's world and essentially reliance on interconnected systems that reside in the virtual space, these are essentially borderless environments. It's almost impossible to imagine two states going to war and fighting the war exclusively in cyberspace. It won't be limited exclusively to cyberspace. There'll be a whole range of kinetic activities going on. There'll be economic warfare. There'll be cyber warfare. There'll be information warfare. There'll be traditional kinetic operations as well. It's going to have to change the organisations that we currently have across defence entities. We are still very heavily armies, navies and air forces. But in the future, as we go down this path where we need to undertake more influence operations and operations in the non-physical space, we need to rebalance our organisations. In future warfare, kinetic domains will increasingly rely on cyber operations. Working in union will add a complexity to conflict which extends throughout a broader combat spectrum. When we think about cyber warfare, about a decade ago, many cyber warfare theorists were focused on cyber warfare as if it would be 
kind of a standalone form of conflict. What we're seeing now is actually something different. Rather than being a standalone separate form of conflict, what we're seeing is that as a force moves into a physical fight, it's not only operating in the land, air, electromagnetic spectrum, uh, maritime environment, but it's also operating in cyberspace. Cyber warfare is really this combination of all these different techniques of warfare that we've been used to over time, but with this very new powerful asset added. So in a major political crisis or real war between two major powers, one country will try to hit another country in such a way that its war effort almost stops dead um, on the spot. What we're looking at is wide ranging, what's called in the uh, literature, cyber paralysis. I would suggest that in the context of how we understand military domains, typically and classically defined through land, maritime and air, increasingly the character of war will speak to the cyber domain and the space domain. And I would submit to you that any future military operation that doesn't account for itself on these non-physical emerging domains will lose. So the idea is, in peacetime, develop as many weapons packages as you can to attack any vulnerable system that the enemy might have, especially attack their command and control, with the expectation that not all of those attacks will succeed, but with the intent that they'll be sufficiently focused and sufficiently targeted to have a very big retarding effect on the ability of the enemy to actually even get to the start line, it's called, of combat. The potential of cyber warfare is devastating. But with such a wide spectrum of possible effects, ranging from espionage to citywide shutdown, gauging the correct level of proportional response can be difficult, and determining whether something is an act of war or not is an important distinction to make. There's actually a significant body of work that's gone into deciding at what level does a cyber attack rise to the point at which you can consider it to be an act of war versus just an act of espionage. When we look at warfare, we've had the Talon Manual, which gives us the rules of the road for how nation states should operate when it comes to cyber warfare operations. In 2007, the Estonian city of Tallinn became an unlikely cyber warfare hotspot. Tallinn is the capital of Estonia, which is one of the first environments where we saw a very significant Russian uh, cyber warfare attack. Estonian authorities had relocated a bronze statue of a World War II Russian soldier, as well as remains from several Soviet war graves from central Tallinn to the outskirts of the city. For the Estonian people, the war memorial represented Russian occupation. For Estonians of Russian descent, it represented liberation from Nazi forces. <laughs> И вот то, что они сделали, это, ну, кощунство. Это беспредел. Всем не нравится, абсолютно всем, всем русским не нравится. Moving the statue to a lesser pedestrianized location was symbolic to both groups. Its relocation fanned polyethnic outrage. Fueled by Russian media, it triggered protests and riots between Estonian and Russian descent Estonian populations which then culminated in a cyber attack said to emanate from an enemy state. The cyber attack disabled Estonia's highly dependent digital infrastructure. Government websites, banking, and the media industry were hit hard. Detecting an attack is not the hard part. The hard part is attributing responsibility for that attack to a particular actor and then figuring out what that actor's intent might be. And that's extraordinarily difficult. And I think something that we're going to see more of as a problem set as just the access to cyber capability grows. Estonia was quick to pin blame on Russia. Its foreign ministry produced a document linking Russian government internet addresses with the attack. Russia has repeatedly denied involvement. When the Estonian cyber attack took place, a new form of warfare was launched, 
non-state actors could strike unnoticed with no need to insert militaries and equipment. As the burgeoning threat of cyber warfare grew, NATO quickly stepped in to independently assess and report on the Estonian cyber attack. The massive waves of cyber attacks which have hit Estonia's websites are a security issue which concerns NATO. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, cyberspace must be protected just as we protect land, air, and sea. Barely a year later, during the European summer of 2008, the Republic of Georgia, a pro-Western neighbor to Russia, fell victim to a series of cyber attacks that disabled government websites, crippled banks, communications, and transport companies. The cyber attack created an informational vacuum, allowing Russia to control the war narrative and smoothing the pathway for their invading forces. By 2009, NATO, along with academics and international lawyers, had composed the Talon Manual, an academic study on how international law applies to cyber conflicts and cyber warfare. NATO has actually stood up a cyber warfare center of excellence, also in Estonia, thinking about how do you counter hybrid warfare in cyberspace. Generally speaking, an attack on a state entity that involves or could involve loss of life or serious injury or could involve damage to a major state asset could potentially be considered an act of war. As though from out of the ether, cyber warfare can come from an enemy state or a lone rogue actor. Evaluating the impact of an attack is one thing, but determining who is behind the attack and why they attacked then informs an appropriate level of proportional response. One of the biggest conundrums of cyber warfare response is attribution. Determining who is responsible and where a cyber attack came from can be like trying to retrieve a needle in space. And a retaliation on the wrong target could be calamitous. It's an incredibly difficult technical problem because it is difficult to disambiguate what is the actual origin of a particular attack. What we don't know in all of this is those cyber hubs and where they're based. Some are based in the known jurisdictions like Southeast Asia or Eastern Europe. We don't know the proxies behind those people. Yes, there can be that person in the basement that's just having a go and having a crack. But we don't know whether they've been enabled by a state or they just learnt themselves or there is a proxy in the middle there for someone else in a hands-off environment. It's also a very difficult uh, geopolitical problem because even in well-defined and well-studied attacks, often attribution is not even stated explicitly. Cyber attacks leave no spent munitions no military equipment, no dog tags to identify dead soldiers. We are now in a period where non-state actors can deliver devastating blows to the economy of the most uh, powerful countries in the world. Self-recruited ad hoc networks that aren't beholden to any state that are sort of free-floating and willing to do their own thing in the service of a particular ideology. We don't really necessarily have something that's equivalent to like a cyber DNA where you can identify a piece of information that's going to directly link to a particular state or a particular individual. The attribution dilemma complicates the cyber warfare landscape and nullifies traditional ideas of deterrent strategies. But states will still look to navigate the digital minefield of cyberspace and enact their strategies to overcome any opposition.
In 2018, in response to the need for states to attribute cyber attacks, the U.S. and its allies launched persistent engagement at the Cyber Deterrence Initiative. And under both those policies, the United States and its allies have agreed to first attribute attacks to the countries undertaking them and warn them at the same time that if those attacks continue, there will be retaliation either in cyberspace or outside cyberspace. The United States, in its 2015 Law of War manual, has said that it's okay to respond to a cyber attack with a kinetic response. As long as the kinetic response is proportional and necessary, that's okay. There's a recent example that suggests they believe the opposite is true as well. So you could respond to a kinetic hard power attack with a cyber attack. In June of 2019, in the Strait of Hormuz off the coast of Iran, an American drone, a broad area maritime surveillance demonstrator, RQ-4 Global Hawk, was shot down by Iran. It was probably intentional, as I said, but uh, regardless, uh, they targeted something without a person in it, so we want to be proportionate. The US responded to this kinetic attack by launching a cyber attack. We've since learned through media reporting and some government leaks that the United States responded to the drone being shot down with cyber attacks against Iran. And they seem to have taken out missile launches and also to have targeted the databases of some Iranian government agencies. Iran claimed the drone violated their airspace. The Americans argued the drone was in international airspace. Assuming that the drone was in international airspace, that would probably give the United States the right to respond. And if that's the case, this is probably an example of what proportionality looks like when it comes to cyber attacks, I think, because the United States seems to have been taking out the capabilities Iran had used to conduct the original attack. And arguably, I think it shows restraint on the part of the United States and seems to have been part of an overall strategy to de-escalate things in the Strait of Hormuz. So to use operations that fall short of conventional definitions of armed force. Operations that fall short of these conventional definitions of armed attack blur the lines between wartime and peacetime and take full advantage of the attribution dilemma. Such operations are conducted in the gray zone not fully secret, not fully covert or clandestine, but certainly not overt, sort of surfing with the, the edge of detectability in that liminal maneuver space. The gray zone, non-geographic, borderless, outside of any real jurisdiction, highly exploitable by adversaries, where the very definition of confrontation can be contested. There is many definitions as you've got fingers and toes, that's how people are seeing grey zone at the moment. You're seeing once again the rise of influence operations, political warfare, information warfare. These things are at the heart and soul of what are currently considered grey zone operations. So in terms of where things go from here, I would think that you would see states operating in the grey zone and taking advantage of legal uncertainty because it allows them to conduct effective operations until the costs of that approach outweigh the benefits. And it's not just legal uncertainties that grey zone operations take advantage of. They also exploit the difficult ethical and political choices surrounding escalation of a crisis into a full-blown war. Some of the examples that we talked about before, um, Russian interference in the 2016 American presidential elections, Stuxnet, under existing definitions, they fall short of the use of force or an armed attack. But I think they highlight that there's a lot you can achieve in terms of preventing a state from conducting its internal affairs. And that in and of itself is an important part of sovereignty and it's an important right in international law. So you can prevent or obstruct a state from doing that without resorting to violence or using an armed attack. And if the walls of the peace war paradigm have been broken down, the potential to win a war without firing a single shot is an incredibly desirable outcome to many states.
cyber warfare can balance the scales of traditional military power, placing power back into the hands of the underdog. It has incentivized countries that were once considered not particularly cyber literate to rush toward enhancing their own cyber capability. Many of the countries that you might think are not particularly significant military threats are actually quickly becoming cyber superpowers. You don't need a huge amount of resource to generate very significant capability. North Korea is a great example. It's put a lot of effort into cyber warfare. The Chinese have very capable cyber troops that were stood up in the early uh, 21st century in response to their lessons learned from watching us in the period since the Cold War. What we're seeing is that boundary between peacetime and wartime um, is evaporating. We've seen the fact that new cyber military capabilities and information warfare capabilities have opened up a new space of political conflict between countries like China and the United States, between Russia and the United States. Cyber capabilities have opened up a new arena of conflict below the level of armed conflict. Revelations that have come out in September 2019 about a cyber attack on Australia by China, Russian interference in the United States presidential elections in 2016. There's some kind of contestation going on there. If the idea of international law is that relations between states will be stable and predictable and peaceful, there's probably something about those attacks that we would want to prevent or govern or mitigate in some way. If I were to make one prediction about how cyber will impact the future of warfare when it comes to international law, I'd say that certain states are going to reach a threshold where operating in the grey zone becomes really uncomfortable. And there's a collective recognition that operations that technically fall short of use of force or armed attack still have tremendous disruptive potential and probably need to be regulated as some kind of breach of sovereignty or interference in the state's affairs. Cyber warfare, a digital missile fired from the gray zone. Malicious code that infiltrates connected infrastructure and takes our world offline. Nations paralyze through non-kinetic warfare. Kinetic warfare bolstered by cyber operations. Cyber warfare is everything while pretending to be nothing. Unseen, malicious, crippling, and costly transcending the other warfighting domains, existing in a future realm with uncertain parameters, yet distinct, fatal, and possibly catastrophic outcomes. If we want to understand the impact of the cyber age on warfare and on military operations, we have to start from the proposition that we're at the dawn of the cyber age. There's been this increased focus on capability and easeability of use, and this notion about how these devices and interconnectivity can be very helpful. The digital and the physical are integrated. They have become overlapped and intermeshed, and separating the two now is almost impossible. What will happen in 10 or 20 years will be very different from what we've experienced in the last five to 10 years. We have gone too far in our reliance on the technologies that have emerge from the digital age post the Second World War. If you sought to untangle that, that would be like untangling humans having cats and dogs as pets. You know, we've got so much history there that untangling humans from digital technology now, I think, would be very much the same. Cyber warfare will shape the warfare of the future and the future of humanity. It's up to us to determine the shape of all things to come. We can't judge the future of warfare against what we've read in newspapers or what we've seen on TV channels about this or that single cyber attack. The future of warfare is for multi-wave, multi-vector attacks against civil, military and community targets on a scale not imagined ever before. It's never been written about in books. There is no book. So look to the future. Don't judge the future by the past.